As individuals, families, communities, cultures, and societies, we have surrounded ourselves with signs and symbols which depict the ideas and principles that define us. We attach to these symbols our feelings and ideals, our customs and traditions, and our values. Some symbols serve with less significance, and to others we assign great importance. One such important symbol is the cornerstone. It is both a tangible article with an important purpose and a symbol that represents the ideas of foundation, preparation, and a point of beginning that looks towards completion and perfection. In its physical state, the cornerstone is prepared for the purpose of determining the physical characteristics of the building of which it is a part. It is the starting point and must be plumb, square, and level if the building is to be the same. Improperly placed or formed, the resulting structure will not be level, out of plumb or square, and will be weak and unable to last the test of time. The structure may not be able to support its own weight and become a danger to its occupants. So important is its preparation and placement. Rituals, ceremonies, and traditions have been attached to the setting of the stone. These practices have existed for thousands of years, which testify to its importance. As a symbol, it represents a properly prepared foundation that will guarantee a successful conclusion, completion, or attainment of perfection or enlightenment. One need only check the internet to see how it is used. People identify their businesses, events, places of worship, products and services with the symbol of the cornerstone. The symbol of the cornerstone conjures images of truth, strength, solidity, and the foundation for success and happiness. Welcome. My name is Jack Rose, and I am the Grand Lecturer of the Grand Lodge of California. The purpose of this DVD is to provide you with information about the Cornerstone Ceremony conducted by the officers of the Grand Lodge of California, Free and Accepted Masons. Those expected to view this video are public officials, new Grand Lodge officers, Grand Lodge inspectors, and Lodge members, particularly those involved in the planning for such events. This video was prepared to allow you the opportunity to view only those portions which might be of interest to you without having to view the entire film. The first part will show you what the actual cornerstone ceremony would look like should you invite the Grand Lodge of California to conduct the ceremony. The second part will show the new Grand Lodge officers where they are to line up prior to the ceremony their part in the procession, and their particular parts during the ceremony. The third part shows the members of the sponsoring lodge, where they will stand prior to the start of the ceremony, and their part during the procession. The final part will show the steps required to plan and execute the ceremony. You can now sit back and enjoy the entire presentation, or fast forward to the sections that are of interest to you. It is our hope that by viewing this film, you will have a better understanding of the purpose and functions of the Grand Lodge Cornerstone Ceremony conducted by the Masons of the Grand Lodge of California. Thank you. Welcome to chapter number one, the history of the Masonic Cornerstone Ceremony. My name is R. Stephen Doe and I am a past Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of California. I wish to thank you for thinking about inviting the Masons, often called Freemasons, to lay symbolically a cornerstone for your public building. Freemasonry is the world's first and largest fraternal organization. This chapter will tell you a little bit about our fraternity and provide some history of the cornerstone ceremony. Our fraternity is the oldest fraternity in the world and encompasses a system of ethics based on the premise that each man has a responsibility to improve himself while being devoted to his family, faith, country, and fraternity. The earliest record of a formal and official Masonic cornerstone ceremony was the laying of the foundation stone of the new Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh in Scotland on August the 2nd, 1738. 
by the Earl of Cromarty, who was then the leader of all Scottish Freemasons. You may ask why Masons are invited to perform this ceremony. As previously noted, it is very old and has been used at the start of many famous buildings. For example, the Masonic Cornerstone Ceremony was used at the start of the construction of the White House in 1792, and later at the building of our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. in 1793. The part that will be performed by the leader of the Grand Lodge of California at your Cornerstone Ceremony was on that occasion performed by President George Washington, who was a Mason and a leader of his Masonic Lodge. This ceremony was also used at the start of construction of the California Supreme Court building and our own state capital in Sacramento in 1861. So why is the cornerstone so important? Its significance goes back almost a thousand years. In those days, there was no steel and the workmen did not have the benefit of all the technology used in construction today. Yet they were able to construct buildings that were 40 stories high using only stone blocks. How did they do this? They did it by cutting each stone for the building at perfect right angles and by laying each stone perfectly level. The building would fall down unless each stone were perfectly cut and perfectly laid. The most important stone was the first stone laid. It was called the cornerstone because it was set in the northeast corner of what would eventually become the finished building. If this cornerstone were not perfectly shaped and level, no other stone above it would be perfectly level either. If the first stone were not plumb, square and level, the air would become more and more exaggerated the further the builder went from that cornerstone. We know through examination of still standing structures built in ancient times, the perfection and exactness demonstrated by the stonemasons who constructed those edifices. The stones had to be perfect. Cornerstone was therefore the most important stone in the building, and its placement was a time for much ceremony and celebration. In ancient times, the laying of a cornerstone included the offering of material things, such as food, which to primitive societies was a way to ensure the success of their buildings. So why do the Masons today still lay, or more often dedicate, Cornerstones for buildings that are not necessarily made of stone. We do it because of its meaning and what it stands for. It is like another symbol familiar to all of us, the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. We pledge allegiance to our flag, not because it is a flag, but instead to show our love, respect, and devotion for our country. This cornerstone ceremony is done because of the importance the selected building has to its users and to your community. Masons lay cornerstones only for public buildings. Hopefully, they will last for many years, but they will only last if properly constructed and properly maintained. We can only hope individually to live long and happy lives if we live in peace and harmony with one another. Symbolically, if you will, each one of us is like one of those stones used in construction a thousand years ago. Each of us must strive to imitate that perfection which the stonemasons sought for each stone that went into their buildings. Just as each stone fit harmoniously into the building, so too, so that each one of us attempt to fit ourselves within our community. This ceremony is a reminder that we'll, we will be a peaceful and happy community 
only when we strive to be the best we can and to do to those around us that which we would like for them to do to us. If you have any questions about this ceremony or would like to invite the Masons to conduct it for you, please contact your local Masonic Lodge or contact the Grand Lodge of California by calling 1-800-831-8170 or visit our website at www.freemason.org. The next portion of this DVD will discuss the actual cornerstone ceremony. Welcome to chapter number two, the cornerstone ceremony itself. This chapter will cover the logistics involved in presenting the actual cornerstone ceremony. The ceremony uses the following items. A stage, at least 15 chairs on that stage. A lectern, a large table covered with a white tablecloth. An easel strong enough to hold the plaque to be placed during the ceremony. That commemorative bronze plaque to represent the cornerstone. A plum, a square, and a level to be provided by the Grand Lodge, a small plate, a vessel of corn, a vessel of wine, and a vessel of oil, all of these also to be provided by the Grand Lodge, and a time capsule together with a content list of the items to be inserted into it. Regarding this time capsule, it is provided by the Lodge and needs to be large enough to hold the items selected for inclusion in it. Therefore, the public entity and the lodge representative should work together closely to determine what items will be placed into the time capsule and how large it should be. In some cases, the lodge will use a large PVC tube with one end sealed and a cap for the other end. This capsule will be used during the ceremony. After the ceremony, when all items have been collected, as some items will come in later, a new capsule can be made to accommodate the items, then sealed and buried in the cavity beneath the plaque. A list of the contents in the time capsule should be prepared and given to the lodge representative, who will deliver it to the grand secretary to be read as part of the ceremony on the day of the event. Additionally, Audience seating should be arranged in a manner that will allow an orderly ceremonial entrance of the Masons to the event. The Masons will adapt to however the host has arranged the audience seating. However, the ideal manner includes a large center aisle, one that will accommodate six men standing shoulder to shoulder. But again, if a center aisle is not available, the seating can be arranged with a large aisle on either side of the room. The cornerstone ceremony conducted by the Grand Lodge of California consists of the following elements. It begins with a welcome by the Master of Ceremonies provided by the host, which should include a formal invitation by the host to the Grand Lodge of California to conduct the cornerstone ceremony. There should be an entrance of the Grand Lodge officers and masons, a salute to the flag provided by the host, an introduction of dignitaries also provided by the host, which should end with the introduction of the Grand Master. And then as part of the cornerstone laying ceremony itself conducted by the Grand Lodge, there will be a summary of the program a placement and adjustment of the cornerstone, and then a celebration of its laying. After the completion of this formal historical portion of the ceremony, there will be an address delivered by the Grand Orator and Officer of the Grand Lodge with a conclusion by the Grand Master. And at the final point, a dismissal by the Master of Ceremonies. At this time, we'll provide you with an exemplification of an actual cornerstone ceremony 
using the ideal audience seating. The ceremonial part of the program conducted by the Grand Lodge of California takes about 45 minutes. This time period is extended depending upon the number of dignitaries introduced, the length of their comments, and any other activities the host may wish to provide prior to the ceremony. It should be noted that it is a custom of the fraternity of free and accepted Masons that before entering upon any great or important undertaking to invoke the aid and blessing of God. Therefore, the ceremony includes a non-sectarian prayer to the great architect of the universe. If this prayer is of concern to the host, it may be eliminated from the ceremony. It is necessary for the host during the planning process to let the lodge representatives know your feelings about the prayer. It should also be noted that some hosts provide special entertainment, such as school band or orchestra, that perform prior to, during, or after the ceremony. Attention should be given to the entertainment's location relative to the Masons' entrance so that the Masons do not interfere with the entertainment. If such entertainment is provided, music appropriate to a ceremonial entrance of the Masons would be much appreciated. At the ceremony's completion, some sponsors have provided tours of their building and are providing refreshments to the attendees. This is certainly an option for the host entity and not a requirement. Please now sit back and watch as we provide a visual summary of an actual cornerstone ceremony conducted by the Grand Lodge of California. Today, we are pretending to conduct the cornerstone ceremony for the Megan Cope Elementary School and are especially honored to have the former principal of Megan Cope Elementary School with us today, Mr. Juan Pelanoza. Please give him a warm welcome.
please post the flag of our country. Honesty and truth, 
our relationships with other people will be honest and true. If we build our lives as soundly as well as we build a building, then we will be as proud of the result as the workers are proud of a properly built building when it is finished. Today, you will witness a cornerstone ceremony that Masons have been performing for hundreds of years. In fact, George Washington, while he was President of the United States and Master of his Masonic Lodge, used the same ceremony to lay the cornerstone for the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. in 1793. The same ceremony was used to lay the cornerstone of our state capital in Sacramento over 150 years ago. Now today, rather than actually placing a cornerstone in its proper place to start the construction of a building, we symbolically place a plaque representing that cornerstone. Now that being said, we will start the ceremony. Friends and brethren, there's been a custom among the fraternity of free and accepted nations from time immemorial to assemble for the purpose of laying the foundation stones of certain buildings when requested to do so by those having authority. The Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Nations of the State of California, having been invited to lay the cornerstone of this building, we have here assembled, and we will now proceed with that pleasant duty. <laughs> Brother Grand Treasurer, It has ever been the custom of the craft upon occasions like the present to deposit within a cavity beneath the stone certain memorials of the period in which this building was erected. So that if in the lapse of ages, the fury of the elements, the violence of man, or the slow but certain ravages of time should lay bare its foundations, an enduring record may be found by succeeding generations to bear testimony to the untiring unending industry of the free and accepted nations. Has such a deposit now been prepared? Grand Master, it has, and the various articles of which it is composed are safely enclosed in the capsule now before you. <coughs> Brother Grand Secretary, you will read the record of contents of the capsule. Thank you, Grand Master. The items for the time capsule. Today's edition of the local newspaper. A list of the elect elected officials for the area. A list of the school board officers. Pictures of the school. Pictures of the administration. Administration of the school. Pictures of each class. A DVD of students in and out of the classroom. A DVD player with detailed instructions on its use. The local lodge Masonic Bulletin. Bulletins from the other lodges in the area. And any other items deemed necessary or important. Thank you, Grand Master. Brother Grand Treasurer. You will now deposit the capsule in its proper place. And may the great architect of the universe, in his wisdom, grant that ages upon ages shall pass away ere it be seen again. Assisting in the placing of the capsule today will be Natasha Morrison and Kira Katz. Ladies, please join me on the stage.
The square, Grand Master. And you will apply the jewel of your office to those portions of the stone which should be square. I have obeyed your order, Grand Master, and find that in this respect the craftsmen have done their duty. Brother Senior Grand Warden, what is the jewel of your office? I have obeyed your order, Grand Master, and find that the stone has been properly adjusted. Our duty having been faithfully and skillfully performed, I declare this foundation stone to be well formed. Lend aid to those who have conceived 
and thus far carried on this goodly enterprise. May he protect the workmen employed upon this building from every accident and long preserve it for the beneficent uses which it is destined to subserve. May he grant to us all an ever bountiful supply of the corn of nourishment, the wine of refreshment, and the oil of joy.
to be college and career ready. Thank you. If after reviewing this video, you would like to invite the Grand Lodge of California to conduct the cornerstone ceremony, the local lodge will need a letter from you formally inviting the Grand Lodge to conduct it. If you do not have a contact person or a contact number for a local Masonic Lodge, you can obtain the information by either calling the Grand Lodge of California at 1-800-831-8170 or by visiting our website at www.freemason.org. The next portion of this DVD will address the detailed placement of the members of the sponsoring lodge. Welcome to chapter number three, the placement of the members of the sponsoring lodge. All Masons will line up in two parallel lines facing the Grand Marshal and proceed into the ceremonial site as follows. The Grand Marshal leads the two lines of Masons into the ceremonial site to a prearranged stopping point. He turns to face them and holding the baton in his right hand extends his right arm to shoulder height. The Grand Marshal walks between the two lines. Each Mason turns inward and steps backwards when reached by the Grand Marshal. Each Mason should step back sufficiently to allow four men standing shoulder to shoulder to walk between them. It is important that no pair of Masons separate prematurely, but wait with patience until they are face to face with the Grand Marshal and his baton before turning and separating them. Once all of the Masons and the two lines have separated, the Grand Lodge officers process between them. The last Grand Lodge officer to pass between the two lines will be the Grand Tyler. The Grand Marshal follows the Grand Tyler. As the Grand Marshal approaches, the rear of the two lines, the last two Masons in each line, step in and follow the Grand Lodge officers. Thus, the last Masons in the lines become the first Masons to follow the Grand Lodge officers to the ceremonial site. When each Mason reaches the Grand Swordbearer, he walks past him and between the Grand Deacons, turning right or left, depending upon what side of the line he is on, and finds an available seat. The next portion of this DVD will address the detailed placement of the Grand Lodge officers. Welcome to chapter number four, the placement and movements of the Grand Lodge officers. When the Grand Lodge officers leave the sponsoring lodge, the Grand Deacons take their rods and the Grand Standard Bearer takes the banner and the banner stand. After the ceremony, they return these to the sponsoring lodge. Upon arriving at the ceremonial site, the Grand Marshal verifies the appropriate placement of the stage and audience seating. He works with the Grand Deacons and the Grand Swordbearer to determine the various ceremonial stopping points. The ceremonial stopping points are where the Grand Marshal will stop to initiate separation of the Masons, where the Grand Marshal will stop and bow to the Grand Master, which initiates movement by the Grand Swordbearer where the Grand Swordbearer will stop to salute the Grand Master and initiate movement by the Grand Deacons, where the Grand Deacons will stand during the Masonic procession, 
where the Grand Marshal, Grand Deacons, and Grand Swordbearer will stand at the conclusion of the procession. Once these stopping points have been identified, the Grand Marshal, working with the Grand Percivant, will line up the Grand Lodge officers in preparation for the procession. The Grand Marshal must have an approximate number of Masons participating in the procession in order to determine where to start the lineup of the Masons. Remember, the members of the sponsoring Lodge and other Masons present will line up in front of the Grand Lodge officers. There must be room for all of them to line up. The Grand Lodge officers are arranged behind the sponsoring Lodge members and other Masons present in the following manner. Grand Lodge officers should understand the nature of the procession. After they have lined up behind the members of the sponsoring Lodge and other Masons present, the Grand Marshal will lead the entire procession into the ceremonial site. The procession of the Grand Lodge officers is as follows. The Grand Marshal approaches the Grand Lodge officers from between the two lines of Masons. The Grand Marshal stops in front of the Grand Master and bows. The Grand Marshal steps to his left and walks to the end of the line of the Grand Lodge officers. The Grand Swordbearer steps to his left and takes the Grand Marshal's place facing the Grand Master. The Grand Swordbearer salutes the Grand Master with his sword and holds the salute while the Grand Deacons do the following. The Grand Deacons interlace the tips of their rods over the Grand Master. The Grand Swordbearer returns the sword to the carry position and turns about face. The Grand Swordbearer then leads the Grand Lodge officers between the two lines of Masons. The Grand Swordbearer stops at the pre-designated stopping point, turns, and faces the Grand Master. The Grand Swordbearer salutes the Grand Master again with his sword, as the Grand Deacons do the following. The Grand Deacons return their rods to the carry position, walk to their pre-designated stopping points, and separate to allow three Masons walking shoulder to shoulder to be able to pass between them. Once in position, they turn about face and bring their rods to a ground. The Grand Master steps to his left and walks around the Grand Swordbearer and between the Grand Deacons. He then goes to the stage to his designated seat. <clears throat> the Deputy Grand Master steps to his right and walks around the Grand Swordbearer and between the Grand Deacons. He then goes to the stage to his designated seat. The Grand Wardens remaining on their respective sides walk by the Grand Swordbearer and between the Grand Deacons. They then go to their designated seats on the stage. The elected Grand Lodge officers and the Grand Chaplain remain on their respective sides and walk by the Grand Swordbearer and between the Grand Deacons to their designated seats on the stage. The remaining Grand Lodge officers walk by the Grand Swordbearer and between the Grand Deacons and turn left or right depending upon the side they are on and proceed to the end of the audience area and take any available seat. The members of the sponsoring lodge follow the Grand Lodge officers to take any available seat. Grand Marshal nods upon reaching the Grand Swordbearer.
The Grand Swordbearer returns his sword to the carry position, turns about face, and walks to and stops between the Grand Deacons. And following the Grand Swordbearer's lead, perform a column left or right as pre-designated by the Grand Marshal and walk out of the view of the audience. The Grand Marshal follows behind the Grand Swordbearer as all four walk out of the view of the audience. The next portion will discuss the particular movements of the principal Grand Lodge officers during the ceremony. This portion covers the movements of the principal Grand Lodge officers during the ceremony. During the ceremony, there is a part where the Grand Master calls upon the Grand Treasurer to deposit the capsule in a cavity beneath the stone or plaque. If the ceremony is to be held at a public school, the Grand Treasurer should, prior to the start, determine from the Lodge Coordinator and or the school representative if there are two children or other dignitaries that could assist him in moving ceremonially the capsule to its spot. In this manner, children from the school or dignitaries from it will have a part in this program. Assisting in the placing of the capsule today will be Natasha Morrison and Kira Katz. Ladies, please join me on the stage. There is no cavity, as in most ceremonies. The Grand Treasurer will simply supervise the movement of the capsule from its place on the table to a place under the plaque. Sometimes this requires the capsule to be placed upon the floor underneath the table and beneath the plaque. During the ceremony, there is a part where the principal Grand Lodge officers are called upon to display and use the working tools of their respective offices to measure the plaque. They are to proceed in the following manner. Each involved Grand Lodge officer goes to the table, picks up the working tool of his office, and responds at the lectern. When the Deputy Grand Master and Grand Wardens are done, the Grand Master approaches the plaque and gives it three blows from his gavel on the words, well-formed, true, and trusty. Brother Deputy Grand Master, what is the jewel of your office? The square, Grand Master. And you will apply the jewel of your office to those portions of the stone should be square. I have obeyed your order, Grand Master, and find that in this respect the craftsmen have done their duty. Brother Senior Grand Warden, what is the jewel of your office? The level, Grand Master. And you will apply the jewel of your office to the stone and see if it is laid in a manner credible to our ancient craft. I have obeyed your order, Grand Master, and find that the stone has been laid in a manner credible to our ancient craft.
Brother Junior Grand Warden, what is the jewel of your house? The plum, Grand Master. Then you will apply the jewel of your office to the stone and see if it's been properly adjusted. I have a bid to order, Grand Master, and find that the stone has been properly adjusted. ceremony there is a part where the Grand Master informs the audience that the fraternity of free and accepted Masons looking ever to the goodness and compassion of the great architect of the universe lays cornerstones with a symbolic offering of corn wine and oil several items then happen <clears throat> after the Grand Master says corn wine and oil the Deputy Grand Master, the Senior and Junior Grand Wardens rise, go to the table, and pick up their respective vessels. As the Deputy Grand Master picks up his vessel of corn, he also picks up the tray, goes to the lectern, pours corn on the tray, and recites the explanation. On completion, he passes the tray to the senior grand warden, steps backward and stands with his vessel. The senior grand warden then pours wine on the tray and recites the explanation. On completion, he passes the tray to the junior grand warden, steps backward and stands with his vessel. The junior grand warden then pours oil on the tray and recites the explanation. When the junior grand warden completes his part, he gives the tray to the grand master and steps back to stand near the grand master. The senior grand warden, deputy grand master, and junior grand warden stand in line, holding their respective vessels, either in back of or off to the side and in back of the grand master. When the grand master has completed this portion of the ceremony, he will return the tray to the junior grand warden who along with the Deputy Grand Master and Senior Grand Warden return the tray and vessels to the table. The Junior Grand Warden then picks up the square, level, and plum and gives them to the Grand Master. The Deputy Grand Master, Senior Grand Warden, and Junior Grand Warden sit down together. The Grand Master then gives the implements to the Principal Architect. When done properly, the ceremony appears to be a team and not an individual effort. The next portion will cover the lodge planning process. Welcome to chapter number five. This chapter covers the lodge planning process. Proper planning takes time and care to ensure that all aspects of the ceremony are completed with the respect it deserves. It should be noted that California Masonic Code Section 407.080 allows Grand Lodge to reimburse a sponsoring lodge for some of the expenses of the ceremony. Be sure to contact the Grand Secretary's office to determine the budgeted reimbursement amount. Grand Lodge of California may be opened in your lodge as part of the day's activities. 
the opening of the Grand Lodge and the sponsoring lodge for the purpose of conducting the cornerstone ceremony is a time-honored tradition. However, you may elect to forego the Grand Lodge opening and have everyone go directly to the ceremonial site if such makes sense for your circumstance. A Grand Lodge opening usually involves the following. It normally begins with a social time, which may involve some refreshments for the arriving Grand Lodge officers, members, families, friends, and other invited guests. There should be a time allotted for the Grand Lodge officers to practice, about 30 minutes, because some of those participating as officers will be filling in for purposes of this ceremony and may not have performed in these positions before. The formal opening of the Grand Lodge is for Master Masons only, and you should budget about an hour for this activity. At the close of the opening, the Grand Lodge is then closed, and the public is invited into the meeting room for remarks and instructions on the cornerstone ceremony to follow. You should probably budget an hour for this activity also. Everyone then adjourns to the ceremonial site. You should allow sufficient time to travel to the site and get everyone in place for the start of the program. Most of the arrangements at the site will have or should have been completed before the Grand Lodge opening. However, there are certain things to be accomplished only when all the participants are at the site, such as agreeing upon the various stopping points, as discussed in a previous chapter, and lining up the Masons and Grand Lodge officers. You should allow about 20 minutes for these arrangements. As you can probably see from what's been discussed, you will need almost three hours plus travel time prior to the start of the ceremony. Therefore, if the Grand Lodge is to be opened, planning should take into account the time the host entity wishes to begin the ceremony. For example, if the host entity wishes to have the ceremony in the early morning, say at 9 a.m. when the school day starts for the children, the lodge will have to be available at 6 a.m. with Grand Lodge being opened at 6.30 a.m. As that time would probably be too early for most of us to travel to the location, you may want to hold the ceremony without a Grand Lodge opening. However, if the ceremony can start at a later time, such as 11 a.m., then the lodge should be available at 8 a.m., with the Grand Lodge being opened at 8.30 a.m. The best time for a cornerstone ceremony is after lunch. In this manner, we do not interfere with the host entity's lunch period. The Grand Lodge can be opened prior to lunch. The sponsoring lodge members and the Grand Lodge officers can have lunch at the lodge and then depart to the site. But remember that the sponsoring lodge and the Grand Lodge of California should make every effort possible to accommodate the wishes of the host entity as to the timing of the event. The next portion will discuss some additional planning points for your cornerstone ceremony. The following are some additional planning points. These are also covered on a checklist, which you may find on the Member Center of the Grand Lodge website. At least five months prior to the event, contact the school district office or other public facility office to identify possible dates for the cornerstone ceremony so that your event can be coordinated with the Grand Master's calendar. Contact the Grand Secretary or Grand Master for available dates for the ceremony. Coordinate the possible dates with the Grand Lodge and the Cornerstone host to arrive at a mutually acceptable date. Submit a written request from the Lodge Master to the Grand Master requesting the Grand Lodge Cornerstone ceremony on the agreed upon date. On receiving a reply of approval of the requested date, notify the Cornerstone host. Schedule a meeting with the host 
either the school superintendent or public facility supervisor and your inspector to discuss duties and responsibilities and to identify items that each will be responsible for. See if the school district can provide buses to transport the Grand Lodge officers and their wives from the lodge to the site and back to the lodge. If not, carpooling should be encouraged. Provide maps from the lodge to the ceremonial site for distribution at the lodge. Obtain the cornerstone engraving information from the host. Traditionally, the plaque or cornerstone will contain the following information. The name of the public entity hosting the ceremony. The names of certain dignitaries. The date. The phrase, Freemasonry supports public schools if the cornerstone or plaque is being laid at a school. The square and compass. The fact that the ceremony was performed by the Grand Lodge of California together with the Grand Master's name and title. Determine what types of items the public entity and the lodge want in the time capsule. Determine where the cornerstone plaque and time capsule will be placed. It usually works better to have the cornerstone ceremony performed inside an auditorium and actually install the plaque and time capsule at a later date. Plan a schedule for the day of the event with the master of your lodge and the host public entity for the ceremony. Working with the master and inspector, prepare an outline of the activities that may occur before and after the cornerstone ceremony, such as a breakfast, lunch, the refreshments, presentations, and the like. Decide who will prepare and provide the printed program to be distributed to the guests as they arrive at the ceremonial site or at the lodge. At least three months prior to the cornerstone ceremony date, check the Grand Lodge Member Center under Lodge Support and review the document entitled Cornerstone Ceremony Guide. Submit the information for the Grand Master's itinerary to the Grand Secretary. Generate and mail invitations to all Grand Lodge officers, as well as to the district inspectors and Grand Lodge committee members in your area. This should include two RSVP cards, one to be returned to the assistant Grand Lecturer and the other to the Cornerstone Committee Chair at least two weeks prior to the Cornerstone date. Mail invitations to local dignitaries, school board members, school district staff members, politicians, local lodges, and others as appropriate. Order the cornerstone or plaque from a local monument company. Determine the size of the time capsule and either arrange for its fabrication or order the time capsule from a local manufacturer. And as mentioned before, one can be prepared out of large PVC pipes with caps. At least one month prior to the cornerstone ceremony date, determine if there are two special individuals from the entity hosting the event that could be selected to assist the Grand Treasurer in moving the time capsule to the cavity. Ask the host representative to identify these individuals and ask them to meet with the Grand Treasurer on the day of the event. Provide these names to the Grand Treasurer and identify these persons to him. Select lodge members to serve as the bearers of corn, wine, and oil, and another member to serve as the principal architect. Appoint a site preparation committee. Contact the Grand Tyler or Assistant Grand Tyler to determine a date to set up the lodge room for the Grand Lodge opening. The host lodge sets up the lodge room in the usual manner prior to the event, complete with their Tyler's register. The host lodge will provide an additional six chairs for the following Grand Lodge officers. The Grand Sword Bear, the Grand Standard Bear, the Grand Bible Bear, the Grand Orator, the Grand Lecturer, and the Grand Persevant. These chairs will be placed 
by the Grand Tyler upon his arrival at your lodge. The Grand Tyler or Assistant Grand Tyler will provide the following items for the cornerstone ceremony. The white tablecloth, two gavels, the vessels of corn, wine, and oil, a plate, a square, a plum, and a level. Identify and gather the Masonic items to be placed into the time capsule. Identify and gather the items from the host to be placed into the time capsule. Prepare a type list of the items for the time capsule and present it to the Grand Secretary on the day of the event. On the day of the cornerstone ceremony, assist the Grand Tyler or Assistant Grand Tyler in setting up the lodge room for the Grand Lodge opening. Send the site committee to the cornerstone host's facility to ensure that all setup requirements have been made. Ensure that a brother takes the lodge's white aprons for masons to wear at the ceremonial site. It is hoped that you now have all the information and or tools necessary to hold a cornerstone ceremony in your community. If you're a public entity and have questions about this matter, please contact your local Masonic Lodge or contact the Grand Lodge of California by calling 1-800-831-8170 or by visiting our website at www.freemason.org. If you are a Masonic Lodge or have any questions about this matter, please contact your district inspector or your assistant grand lecturer.